Welcome to Pastor Bill's Classroom. We are in our study of the Corinthian Letters, Lesson 59, entitled, Transformation, Part 2. Hello, welcome back to our midweek study. I apologize for long sleeves and long pants, because that's not normally the way you see me. But it has been cold here. Uh, not just cold for it for November, cold as far as anything. We had, I don't know, seven straight days of below 60 temperatures, which is really cold, nine inches of rain. We've had an event around here, but today, uh, warming up a little bit, but still not warm enough for me to uh, wear normal clothes. So don't, uh, so if you, something looks out of the ordinary, it's because it is. Uh, but not out of the ordinary is going to be our time together with the Word of God and uh, the Spirit of God teaching us the truth of what God has for us. We're in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 12 through 19. We began last time looking at this whole issue of uh, our bodily resurrection based upon the bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ. And the fact that those two things, those two events are tied together. If one happened, and it did, resurrection of Jesus, then the other inevitably will. All others who, uh, I mean, as we saw last time, whether trusting in Christ or not, eternity is going to be a place for humans. Of a, it's going to be a bodily experience, not out of the body, but in a body uh, forever. So 1 Corinthians 15, verses 12 through 19, let's pray together and ask God's intervention on our behalf so we can understand, and then we'll move forward in what he has for us. God, we thank you uh, that you have given us your word and that your word can be relied upon. Every bit of it is true. And where it disagrees with what we believed or the way we've lived, God, we ask for the power to help us change uh, and, and do what you say, live what you say, be what you say. Thank you, God. Thank you for uh, all that you do for us, God. Open our eyes now, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. So studying 1 Corinthians, studying chapter 15, we're in a chapter on the resurrection, and, and as I said last time, the culture of Corinth had a major effect on the thinking of the early church, in, in that they had a problem with the resurrection. It was just a, a Greek, thought, Greek thought was they had no use for the physical body. Now, they have a problem with immortality of the soul, but they had a strong doubts about the whole future of the physical body, and they had similar questions as the ones we have, like, why do I need to live in eternity in a body? Well, there, there's uh, a large answer to that question. Uh, I guess I should say a full-orbed answer to that question, but there is a, the largest answer to that question is just simply this. That's the way God created us. He created us body, soul, I should say spirit, soul, and body, and he's not going to be robbed. And as it stands right now, God is being robbed. Uh, by a particular thief by the name of Satan, who has robbed him of everything, truly, uh, stolen from him because of sin and the fall, uh, and God is in the process of redeeming it all back. He's literally buying it back, not just us, but the whole creation. But in particular, that's our interest here, is us. Uh, he began redeeming by redeeming our souls when we trust Christ as personal Savior, our spirit soul is redeemed. In fact, we become a new creation at that point. Any man be in Christ, what? He is a new creation. Not going to be, but he currently is. So, so part of him has already changed. Well, it's inevitable if two-thirds of you is already a new creation, then the one-third, your body, is going to follow suit. It just makes sense logically, but it also makes sense because, again, like I said, God's not going to be robbed from So if, if anything else, you just simply need to know, the way God created us to be is the way we're going to be. He created us to be body, soul, and spirit, and he's not going to be robbed from. He's going to be redeeming all of it back. And that process of redeeming our bodies is something that is unstoppable. I read a story uh, that I thought kind of fit this bill in some ways. Uh, true story, I don't think so, probably a legend, but it was of a German, German princess who on her deathbed uh, wanted to make sure that her tomb wasn't robbed. And it was a common thing. You know, of course, a wealthy person like herself would be buried with some very important implements and, and otherwise just reasons to rob a tomb like that. And uh, people typically did it. Now, maybe not the next year, but they would wait until, I mean, how long can you guard a tomb? And so to make sure that her grave wasn't robbed, she put orders in for the way she was to be buried. She was going to have her casket buried between 
uh, granite slabs on all sides, and it was going to be bounded all around by these huge rock columns, and then it was all going to be strapped together with these iron bands and clamps. And uh, it went exactly like uh, she wanted it to, according to her, her will. Uh, the problem was is that the people buried her, unfortunately, uh, unnoticed to them, buried her also with a tiny acorn. So just an acorn off an oak tree happened to get in the midst of all this iron and rock and, uh, and granite. And, of course, no big deal. I mean, what's an acorn, right? Unless it germinates, which is what happened. Uh, it sprouted, and the tiny plant found its way to the sun through the crack of, I guess, of this whole tomb. And uh, uh, 30 years later, guess what happened to her tomb? Now, the power of an uh, oak tree split it apart. In the same way, the process of God, albeit seemingly slow, is unstoppable. It's not going to be stopped. And again, the Greek response to Paul's sermon on Mars Hill is probably typical of the thinking of the day with regards to the physical body. Who needs a physical body? They had an issue. Watch, they, they sneer at him. So he preached in, in Acts 17 about the resurrection of the dead. And notice their response. When they heard of the resurrection of the dead, they mocked. And others said, well, we'll hear you again on this matter. Because it was, not, it was unthinkable to a Greek. Uh, the whole culture believed that there was no such thing as a resurrection of the body. Again, an illustration of, just like we have today, even though the whole culture votes and says it's not going to go that way, doesn't mean anything. You want to know what the truth is? Consult the scriptures, not culture, not the majority. They've been wrong many times and are still wrong, I would, I would submit to you. So, so that's their typical thinking demonstrated here by their response to Paul's sermon. The Corinthian church uh, didn't think it mattered whether or not people got their bodies resurrected. And they were wrong about that. Uh, and it does matter a lot. And, and let me just say as a side commentary on that, the details of Scripture matter. It matters that we were resurrected because it ties directly to Jesus' resurrection. There's other reasons why it matters, but that's the main reason. Uh, it matters, here's not to open another can of worms, but uh, it matters, we're going to be studying this as winter Texans if you want to be a part of our Bible study this coming winter, uh, it matters that we were created, the world was created in six consecutive 24-hour days without gaps in between. It matters that we believe that because that's what the Scripture teaches. It matters because there's people that feel like they can play football with the Scriptures and make it say whatever they want. So if they can make it say whatever they want, then they then become the authority, no longer God. So I guess they were back there when he created everything because they feel free to say, for instance, that God created through the means of evolution. Where do you find that? Well, they're writing in between the lines of the Scriptures, and I would not trust a person who feels like they can do something like that. Let the Scriptures say what they say and mean what they say. These truths, such as creation, such as the resurrection, are foundational. Everything, especially the creation, is predicated in the Bible, is predicated on a six, 24-hour day, consecutive day, day creation. Everything's predicated on it. Nowhere in the Scriptures are they contradicted. Nowhere, not even Jesus does it say, does he ever say that it's anything other than exactly that. He refers to it several times. It's referred to all the way through the Bible. So either you believe, again, what the Bible says, or you don't, but don't believe something different and say that that's what the Bible says. You don't have a right to do that. So let the Bible say what it says. Uh, it, it, the truths matter. The, the truth of the resurrection matter. Again, just like the creation. Everything in the Bible is predicated on the resurrection of Jesus, not the least of which is our own resurrection. Paul essentially relates to the Corinthian church that if you take away the resurrection for believers, you take away everything else they possess. It's not a small issue. Again, leave the Scriptures alone. And please stop thinking that what's running around between your ears is of the level of value that you can call and question what the Scriptures say. Just let them say what they say. Let them say it. The Scriptures, we don't decide what the Scriptures say. The Scriptures decide what we say. If it says in the Scriptures, that's what we say. Boom. Period. No more discussion. So, so the paraphrase of what Paul's going to say here is effectively, if the dead are not raised in general, back to the resurrection... Then, the dead, then dead men in particular are not raised, which also points to one particular man who died, namely Jesus. 
And if Jesus was not raised, then everything that we have as Christians is utterly worthless. Let's, let's consider. My paraphrase is not near as important as what the Scriptures actually say. So let's take a look here. Verses 12 through 19, chapter 15 of 1 Corinthians. Now, if Christ has preached that he was raised from the dead, how do some among you say there is no resurrection of the dead? In other words, that's the message that you got, but now you're giving us a different message. Again, messing with the Scriptures. They're doing the same thing. But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. So notice he ties directly. So you say you're not physically going to be resurrected, then you can't say Christ was physically resurrected. They're tied together. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain, and your faith is also in vain. Moreover, we are even found to be false witnesses of God because we witnessed against God that Christ was raised, whom he did not raise if, in fact, he did not raise him. The dead, in fact, if in fact the dead are not raised. So again, it goes from the smaller to the greater, to the greater to the smaller. For if the dead are not raised, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is worthless. You are still in your sins. And then those who also who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. And if we have hoped in Christ in this life only, we are of all men most to be pitied. So, so he goes over several things that I want us to break down here together. What happens if we take the resurrection out? What happens if we take our own resurrection out, which also removes Christ's resurrection from the equation? What happens? If people in general are not raised, and Christ in particular was not bodily raised, then number one, Christian preaching is useless. He says that in verse 14. Take a look. It's not the act of preaching, but it's the content of preaching. What's the content of what we preach? Look back in verses 3 and 4, chapter 15. Here's the content. For I delivered to you, here's false preaching, that's what we preach today. I delivered to you as of first importance that I also received, what I also received, that Christ died for, the, for our sins according to the Scriptures. Again, let the Scriptures say what they say. And that he was buried... And that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. And that he appeared to others. And so it goes, goes on to there. So, so, so we have not just the, the content. So the content of what we preach is now worthless. It's useless. In other words, if we leave Jesus in the tomb, we empty the gospel of all of its contents. You really empty the Bible of all its contents. So again... We, we play football with these terms and thinking that it's not that big of a deal because it doesn't matter if we change one thing here and there and not understanding how the scriptures are put together. They are all completely interwoven. If you unravel one part of it, it all comes unraveled. Everything truly is predicated on the resurrection of Jesus. Everything is. So, so the Christian faith becomes worthless when there is no resurrection. Of what use is one more dead religious leader? So, so Christian preaching is useless, in number two. Faith in that preaching is also useless, verse 14. So we hear a lot about faith We hear in our culture. Faith this, faith that, keep the faith, got to have the faith. All religions require faith, including atheism, which is also religion. They believe stuff about the future that they can't prove in a place where they've never been. They assume nothing's going to happen after they're dead. They just get annihilated. That requires a lot of faith because they have never been there before. Faith is the substance of things not seen, right? True for atheism, true for Christianity. There is no merit in faith by itself. In fact, faith is only as valuable as the object upon which the faith is placed. So if your object is worthless, so is the faith. Uh, Christian faith becomes worthless when there is no resurrection. Again, of what use is one more dead religious teacher? What, what do we need one more of those? we got tombs filled with them. So Christian preaching is useless. Faith in that preaching is useless. Number three, if there is no resurrection, those who preach the gospel are guilty of perjury against God. He says that down in, in uh, verse, well, where was it? Where if, I, sorry, lost my spot there. And those who have fallen asleep, and if we've hoped in Christ, and so moreover, we even found to be false witnesses, verse 15. I didn't write it down. Verse 15, found to be false witnesses. And the list of liars 
If God didn't raise Jesus from the dead, but we've been preaching that, the list of liars begins pretty high. Look down at, look back at verse, uh, verses 5 through 8. Here's a list of liars who appeared to deceive us. That would be Peter. Peter says he resurrected. He appeared to 500 other brethren, of all whom remain uh, until now, but some have fallen asleep. He appeared to James, that's the brother of Jesus, and all the apostles. And last of all, as it were, an untimely born, he appeared also to me. So Paul puts himself in the list of liars if there is no such thing as a resurrection, because all these guys and gals preach the truth of the resurrection. So they're all liars. By the way, the biggest liar, if there is no resurrection, if Jesus doesn't resurrect, is none other than Jesus himself. Because he promised. He would only be in the grave three days. Three days and three nights, he was going to resurrect, never to die again. So if the resurrection didn't happen... Jesus himself is a liar. If the resurrection happened, then, then, then we are guilty of perjury who preach the fact that it did, when in fact it didn't, if that is true. And then the fourth thing, faith in the gospel of a resurrected Savior is also futile. Uh, it, it's, it's also futile. Verse 17, it is futile because that faith doesn't supply the one thing that we need the most, which is forgiveness of sins. So what good is one more religion that doesn't forgive my sins? Because that's my problem eternally is a separation from a holy God. So, so if, I, if, if, if my faith in a, in a gospel that says Jesus resurrected and paid, therefore paid for my sins, and he in fact wasn't resurrected, that I'm not forgiven. In the hall of faithful of Hebrews 12, Hebrews 12, where it lists all these people who by faith did this and by faith did that and by faith did this and put themselves through hard times and or left countries and family and did all these things, the, the, the hall of the faithful becomes the hall of the foolish. Because not only did they do all these things and suffer in this life, that when they left this life, they died in their sins and are going to be eternally separated from God. Wow, how foolish is that? If, in fact, there is no resurrection, they definitely are foolish. And then a fifth thing. If there is no resurrection, believers in that gospel that say Jesus was resurrected have, and have passed away, are lost forever. Verse 18, look at it. They're lost forever. If Christ has not been raised, then they are gone for good. I read this uh, statement made by Carl Sagan. Remember him? He died back in the 90s. Uh, big, big atheist. Uh, believed in the cosmos. The cosmos does everything. The cosmos became God for him. And so, Anyway, so he, he died in his atheism, and his wife uh, made this statement at his death. Here's her aunt, name was Anne uh, Druyan. Here's what she said, according to his, what happened at his deathbed. There was no deathbed conversion, speaking of Carl. No appeal to God. How sad. No hope for an afterlife. He was not pretending that he and I were not saying goodbye forever. So, I mean... He wasn't a hypocrite, say that for him. But how sad is that, right? Well, this is also how sad it is for us who believe in a resurrection, who pass away believing in a resurrection, if in fact there was not one. All believers who have believed in Jesus, who in fact didn't resurrect, if that is true, uh, then this is also true for them. It's true. There's no forgiveness of sins. Eternally gone. Forever. How sad. How sad. And then a sixth thing. If there is no resurrection, without the resurrection, Christians are the most pitiful group there is. Verse 19, take a look. We read it, but let's read it again. If we have hoped in Christ in this life only, we are all men most to be pitied. I hear Christians say all the time, contradicting this, if, all, if, if, if Christianity uh, were false, then the Christian life is still the best life there is. That's not what Paul says. And we're the, of most to be pitied. I love the paraphrase. It says it this way. If all we get out of Christ is a little inspiration for a few short years, we're a pretty sorry bunch. In other words, it wrecks everything when we say there is no resurrection. It's not a small thing. It's everything. We need to drop the issue of the resurrection. So, and we suffer greatly from an otherwise cheap understanding of what it means to be Christians. Uh, others seem to think that Christian living is a ticket to things like health and prosperity and wealth and all these things. Uh, Paul didn't seem to think so. He didn't. 
We suffer great, like I said, from otherwise cheap understanding of what it means to live the Christian life. We fashion for ourselves a crossless Christian life. I don't mean necessarily without Jesus' cross. I'm talking about without ours. Jesus says, unless a man deny himself, take up his cross daily and follow me, he cannot be my disciple. So every day deny myself, every day take up my cross was an implement of death. Was it just heavy? You're headed to your death or you're carrying a cross. That's what the Bible describes as the Christian life. Service and sacrifice. That's the way Paul understood it. That's why the New Testament explains it. It's, 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 a, it, it's a life of service and sacrifice because of the one who has died and resurrected, and we're headed to that same resurrection. Our Lord is risen, ladies and gentlemen. We will rise with him. So we need to be very careful, pay very careful attention that we're currently living in a way that will please a risen Savior. I hope that's your heart. I hope it is. Heavenly Father, I thank you that you have worked the work of your salvation, completing it with, by raising your son Jesus, proving that he is the Savior, proving that through him the world is going to be judged, proving that we can totally trust him and that he can save to the uttermost those who come to you through him. Thank you for the resurrection. Thank you for this word. We need to hear it. It's in Jesus' name we pray these things. Amen. Thanks for visiting. Find us at www.islandbaptistchurch.org.